Uh, today we have with us Guy Steele, a name that may be familiar to many of you. Uh, he's had a hand in a number of specifications for programming languages, including Common Lisp and Java, which I think there's some people in this office who might use those. Uh, and he's asked me to keep the introduction short. So here he is. OK, thank you, Matt. It's good to be here. I see a number of familiar faces in the room, including some I didn't expect to see here today. So thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy this talk. It's about uh, parallel programming. And I feel like in, at Google, I may be kind of preaching to the choir about parallel programming. But I've got my own perspective on it. And this is a talk that I give in other places. So if nothing else, you can hear the message that I'm, I'm giving in other places as well, most recently just at uh, Harvard last month. So the main point of this talk is that I think that the best way to write parallel pro applications is as much as possible not to have to think about the parallelism. Parallelism is something that comes hard to our brains for some reason. And there is a need for separation of concerns. And I think the issue is not so much thinking about parallelism as such as just thinking about independence of computation. And the problem is that our programming languages today don't help us to express or to indicate when computations are relatively independent of each other. There's a specific bugaboo of mine uh, having to do with the accumulation paradigm. And accumulation tends to be inherently sequential. And so in a nutshell, my slogan, my oversimplified slogan is accumulators are bad, divide and conquer is good. And I think this is an old message. I'm not the first one to discover this, but I think we need to take it seriously. Also, algebraic properties are important. I've got a background in uh, applied algebra. And I think that it has informed my programming. And I think that mean, making programmers aware of algebraic properties of their code and communicating some of those uh, properties to the compiler may be worthwhile. So to start, let's add up a bunch of numbers. Suppose I have an array x, and it's of length 1 million, and I want to add up all the numbers in x. So here's some code. Can it be parallelized? And the question is, who cares? There's a bug. I forgot to initialize sum. <laughs> this is a very common bug, and it bothers me all the time. <laughs> OK, with this code, can it be parallelized? Well, the problem is that this code is already bad. It has an inherently sequential flavor to it. We've used this do loop whose semantics is inherently sequential. And clever compilers have to undo this. In fact, Fran Allen won a Turing Award for devoting her life to writing compilers that can undo code like this and turn into code that a parallel computer can really run. So what does a mathematician say to add up a bunch of things? Well, we've got this big sigma notation. And with the explicitly parameterized version, it looks a lot like that do loop. Uh, as i goes from 1 to a million, add, uh, select x sub i and add them up. Or maybe we just write a big sigma in front of it and leave it to the mathematician to figure out how to add them all up. Compare this to the sum intrinsic in Fortran 90. This says what to do. I want to add a bunch of things, but doesn't tell you how. So there's no commitment yet as to strategy. And what I'm all about is not committing too early to the strategy of doing something, if you can just say what you want done. OK, let's go back to this do loop. It's written in a language that is remarkably similar to Fortran. I call it Fortran. And we'll be seeing some other programming languages along the way. So this, this is Fortran code. And um, what this code describes is a computation tree for the addition. Now, there are some other computations well having to do with the mechanics of running that do loop. But essentially, what you're doing is describing how, to this variable sum, you're going to add in the individual x sub i's. And so we get this, this compu binary computation tree that looks like this that describes just the summations and their arguments. And you see that it's got this long left linear spine. That's what makes it inherently sequential. You've got no choice. Uh, you can't do any of the upper additions until you've done the one at the bottom. So you've got to start with a 0, add x sub 1, then add x sub 2, and so forth. OK, now there, there, one could try uh, to parallelize it by saying, well, let's make the do be parallel. So we can do that. We'll mark the do parallel. Wonderful. Everything is sweetness and light? Well, no. The problem is we've got race conditions now. It might be that if we execute all of the, bo the body instances of the body of the do loop in parallel, that they some of them might pick up sum, add in their own individual x sub i, and then do the store. And the problem is that some of the summations will be lost that way. And so uh, we can indeed add them in any order, but we may lose some. Well, the way to fix that is to say, well, the problem is we pick up the sum, and we add something, we put it back. Let's make that atomic. Great. Now the program is correct again. <laughs> but it's not parallel. We can add things in any order, but we can't add things simultaneously. And just doing them out of order really doesn't bias a lot, uh, necessarily. OK, so this is really the computation tree we'd like. It allows us to take the million things and add them pairwise. And as a result, we get a tree whose height 
is proportional to the logarithm of the number of things to be added up rather than to the number of things itself. Now, it makes the, the thing wide, and we need processing resources to make it work. But if we have enough processor resources available, then in principle we can do it in log time instead of linear time. So that's the kind of trade-off we're looking at. And of course, this is a very simple example. We're going to look at something more, diff more interesting in a few, a few slides. But first, I'm going to turn my attention to the problem of finding the length of a Lisp list. I have to get some Lisp into this talk somewhere. And I promised you several programming languages. OK, so here's a, here's a list that is made up of chained records that are connected by pointers. And if you're only given the pointer to the front of the list, it would seem that you necessarily need to do things linearly. You can't find that fourth block in the list without following the, the pointers. And uh, here is the Lisp code for finding the length of that list, uh, to take the length of the list. If the list is empty, then return 0. Otherwise, look at the rest of the list, take its length, and when you get the answer back, get 1. OK, so this is a, a typical recursive formulation in Lisp. The total amount of work is theta of n, and the delay is omega of n. That is, it takes at least length of the list because you have to chase down those pointers to find it. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow parallelize this? Well, the, if you had a processor at every record, there, there are tricks you can do, but I'm not going to assume that. Instead, we could choose to represent the list in a different way. And this points out the difference between linear versus multi-way decomposition. We had no choice but to use a linear algorithm on that list because of the way the list was represented. So data can dictate the way code works. And linear link, linearly linked lists are, in, in effect, inherently sequential. Compare this to piano arithmetic, where you represent the number 5 by a 0, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1. We know that one can do arithmetic with numbers represented in this way, but it's so much more efficient to use the binary form. And if you add binary numbers from right to left, then in fact you can do the addition in time linear in the length of the representation, but the length of the representation is logarithmic in the size of the number, so you've saved a log. And if you use carry look ahead ladders, you actually get a double log effect. So you can actually add a number, two numbers in time log log of the size of the number. OK, so these are, these are wonderful parallel efficiencies. In order to get this, you need a multi-way decomposition para paradigm. So here's some Haskell code for finding the length of the list. And uh, instead of having two cases, the empty list and the other case, we're going to have a three-way decomposition of an empty list, a singleton, and then more than one. So the length of an empty list is 0, the length of a singleton list is 1. And otherwise, we're going to take the list and chop it into two pieces, A and B. Notice how, that how the code doesn't actually say how to chop it. It just says, if the list is a concatenation of two smaller things, we can take their lengths and add it up. So this, this amounts to a summation problem. We're adding up a bunch of ones. But how we obtain those ones uh, dictates the uh, efficiency of the algorithm. Uh, the total work is going to be theta of n, but the delay could be O of n. And it could, it could be as big as O n. In fact, it could be worse. It, but it will be at least omega of log n, depending on how you split the lists. If you manage to split the list into approximately equal pieces at each step, you'll get a log time. If it's not approximately equal, then it could be a little bit worse than log. And this, in, in turn, assumes that the splitting itself has constant cost. So the splitting is worse than constant cost. Then that factors into the equation here, too. OK, so with all that as background, now I'd like to tell you about this toy programming problem for which we're going to see four solutions. And I want to thank Dan Nussbaum and Steve Heller for suggesting this. Uh, I think it actually may have appeared in some Google questionnaires for, for employment. I'm not sure. Uh, you can tell me once you've seen the problem. So we're given this array of integers. And we're going to regard the array of integers as describing a bar chart. OK, so for each integer, there's a bar of that height and of unit width. And now what we're going to do is pour water over it. And the question is, how much water does the, does the diagram hold? It's kind of a funny-shaped bowl. OK, some of you are nodding your heads in recognition. You've seen the problem before. That's fine. OK, well, there are lots of different ways to solve it. I'm going to show you four today, one of them sequential and three of them parallel. And the key insight is that we might be able to compute the water on top of each bar separately and then just add them up. This gives us, this gives a, a, de, a, this gives us a decomposition into in, independent pieces. This, in turn, gives us the opportunity for parallelism, possibly. We're going to look at a sequential solution first. And the key insight is the amount of water that can be on top of any one bar, such as this one that's of height 2, is dictated by how tall is something to its left and how tall is something to its right that can contain it. So you find the tallest thing to the left, the tallest thing to the right, and you take the smaller of those two, and that dictates how much water can fit, can, get, will, will be contained. Then from that height of the water, you then subtract the height of the bar itself, and that tells you how much water was used to fill in that space. OK, so what we're interested in is knowing, for each position in the array, what is the tallest thing to the left and what is the tallest thing to the right? 
Well, we can determine tallest things to the left by doing a left to right sweep, doing a max accumulation. I said the nasty word accumulation, but this is going to be a sequential algorithm. So we start with minus infinity, and we sweep through the array from left to right, and at every, every step, max into that accumulation. And that gives us a sequence of values shown here in the red at the bottom. Uh, we hit the thing of height two, so we, the answer is two. Now we hit a thing of height six. It's going to be six for a while. Then we hit the eight, which is the tallest thing in the whole bunch. It's eights all after that. Similarly, we can do a right-left sweep and find the, the tallest things to the right. Then at each position, we have the tallest thing to the left and the tallest thing to the right. We find the minimum of those two, shown here as little green horizontal bars. And now we abstract that away. That's the information. So that is the minimum height, the minimum of the tallest thing to the left and the tallest thing to the right. And now we compute the water for each bar by filling in the bars and doing the relevant subtraction. And that gives the answers at the top. And uh, all we have to do then is add them up. Let's hit that with big sigma and not worry about how we do that. And the answer is 35. OK. So given this outline for how to go about it, we can see some sequential code. Here's some sequential code. Can anyone guess what language this is? <laughs> OK. Anyone but Jan. <laughs> OK. <laughs> that gives it away. <laughs> Anyone but David. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, this, this is Fortress code. It may look like pseudocode. That's because Fortress is a programming language designed to look kind of like mathematical pseudocode and to use mathematical notation. But I assure you this is actually actual functioning running code, or at least it was as of three years ago, last time I checked it. OK, so here's code. Uh, we're going to uh, compute the uh, histogram. I call this histogram water because it's kind of a histogram um, uh, related application. And it takes an array x, which uh, it takes, I'm going to use 32-bit integers uh, indicated as e32, to index the array. And the array contains elements of types, type integer 32. And the histogram routine is going to return a value of type z32. And uh, we're going to let n be the length of the array. That happens in the second line. And then we're going to get rid of the discharge, the, uh, the trivial case by saying if n is 0, just returns 0. That way, I don't have to worry about some, some boundary cases down in the bottom of the code. And uh, essentially, the structure of this code, I'm not going to go through this line by line, but I'm going to point out that there are three loops in the array. Uh, one of them is for the left to right sweep, one is for the right to left sweep, and one is for the final computation and summation. And uh, you can see that the left to right sweep is doing this max accumulation into left, and the, uh, uh, the right to left thing is doing this max accumulation. And the last one has this computation where we're taking a left and a right, taking the minimum of the two, subtracting x sub k itself, which is the height of the bar, and accumulating that into the result. Then we return the result. OK, so this code is OK. It does the job. It gives you the right answers. Uh, we could try to optimize it. Why? I don't know, because optimization is what compiler guys do. <laughs> And one thing we can do is diffuse the last two loops. So we can, instead of doing it in three passes of the row, we can do it in two passes, one left to right and one right to left. And during the right to left pass, as we're accumulating the maxes, then we can also do the rest of the accumulation as well. So that's a typical thing for a compiler to do is diffuse loops. OK, so that's that. Now let's look at, is there any questions about that sequential version? OK, I ran through that really fast because the interesting stuff is coming up. Let's consider a pure divide and conquer approach. I indicated that we can compute the water on top of each bar independently once we have the information from the sweeps anyway. At least that was one way of getting that information. But if we can compute the water on each bar separately, then maybe we could recursively decompose the graph down to its individual bars, compute the water on top of each bar, and then pairwise combine solutions. So that would sort of look like this. Well, it turns out a single bar can't contain any water. In fact, a pair of bars can't contain any water either. There's nothing to contain. But then when we start combining groups of two into groups of four, suddenly there are places to contain water. And then we can combine those guys into groups of eight, and then finally into the big group of 16. I conveniently chose an, or length of, an array of length 16 precisely, so the binary decomposition wouldn't have corner cases. And that involves extra programming, but it can be done. OK, so we would like to, uh, how do we do this um, recursive decomposition? How do we compute the water on each single bar? Well, we know the answer is zero. So the meat of it is really in how do we combine uh, groups into larger groups. And the thing to realize is that we don't need the internal structure of a group of stuff. I'm going to call that group a glob. All we really need to know is how much water it already contains and what is its outline. So there's this idea of a bitonic outline. Why do I say it's bitonic? Well, you know the word monotonic means that something only increases or only decreases. I probably got that backwards for you. 
but monotonic means it's, it's monotone. It just goes in one direction. Bitonic means it can go up and then it go, can go down. Or as I said of the Monty Python Bri Brontosaurus, it's very thin at one end, much, much thicker in the middle, and then very thin again at the far end. <clears throat> so think of the Brontosaurus when you look at these globs. OK, so in order to combine two bitonic globs, here's one on the left and one on the right, what we're going to do is abstract them. So all we have is the outline of the total amount of water in it. We actually don't even know to the shape of, we don't even need to know the shape of the water, just how much water is in it. So we'll abstract that as an integer. So here's a bitonic glob on the left. It has 11 water. And a bitonic shape on the right. And it has two water. And we want to combine them and figure out how much more water they can hold and turn that into a single glob. So the trick is to find an abstraction that can represent individual things. You can combine them. And the result is another instance of that same abstraction. So in order to combine them, we stick them together. We figure out how much water will go in there. We take a new bitonic outline that covers the combined thing. And then we add up those three numbers. And that will give us the new water. And now we have a new instance of a, of a single bitonic glob. OK, so how are we going to accomplish that? Let's, let's dig down a little deeper into the representation of one of these globs. Going back to this one, we know that it has 35 water in it. Oh, and that, that water switched font. I'm not quite sure what's up with that. OK, and we're going to break the outline into three pieces. Um, all we need to represent a bitonic outline is a list of the plateaus, the horizontal segments, and in order. And what we need to know for each one is its height and its width. And we could just have a list of height-width pairs. We're going to be a little more tricky here and break out and identify the highest plateau, because that's going to be of interest to us in the combining algorithm. So there in sort of turquoise at the top is this little plateau. And it is its peak. And then we're going to have a list of the plateaus to its left and a list of the plateaus to its right. So here are the uh, indications of the height and width. Here are the height-width pairs for each plateau. And we're going to represent that this is a five-element data structure that looks like this. A list of the plateaus to the left, the height and width of the plateau at the top, a list of the plateaus to the right, and then finally the water itself. We clear on that? OK, I see a few nodding heads. That's good enough to go. OK, so here's Fortress code for that. We're not going to go into this detail, but notice that at the top there's an object declaration. A glob is a record structure with five components left, high to the top, width to the top, the right list, and the water in it. We've got a couple of utility routines. There's its width routine in the second line, whose job is to take the list, uh, a list x of height width pairs and add up the widths. So for every pair, it's adding up the q values. There's this thing fill, which takes such a list and a number m, which is the height of water you'd like to see above it, and figures out how much water actually fills in by uh, looking at each bar and looking at its height p, subtracting that height p from the proposed water level m, multiplying that by the width q, and then adding them all up. So that fills in. And the bottom is some fortress boilerplate that has to do with making uh, a binary operator whose symbol is O plus and being able to use it as a big reduction operation. So don't worry too much about that boilerplate, but notice that in the second line of the declaration of object glob reduction, it says it extends monoid reduction of glob. That's essentially a promise that the, the O plus operator, the combining operator, is going to be associative. That, in turn, will justify a parallel implementation. Uh, in the third line, it also claims to be a reduction of zeros. There is a zero for the addition operation, but we're not going to get into the details of that. OK, so to combine two bitonic globs, there are three cases. It might be that the left one has a higher peak than the right one, the right one has a higher peak than the left one, or the heights of the two peaks are the same. OK, and for each of those cases, we can have a little piece of code that handles it. And for each one, we're going to have to figure out how to fill in the water and then make a new outline that uh, essentially bridges the water. The water will extend some plateau. Uh, and we'll have to figure out how to make a new outline. The interesting case is the one down the middle. Notice that um, uh, I'm, we're thinking about right and left from your point of view now. Yes, notice how the, the result at the bottom in the center column reuses the left-hand part of the outline from the top. But the right-hand piece has to be constructed of three parts. Uh, the, uh, no, sorry. The right-hand right, right hand is used, yes. And on the left, the uh, left-hand outline consists of three parts. The left-hand outline of the lower glob 
and the little piece that gets constructed to span the water, and then a piece of the left-hand outline of the higher glob. And uh, in, in order to get that piece of the outline of the higher glob, uh, we had to take its left-hand list outline and split it into three pieces. And here's a utility operation for doing that split. Essentially, it takes a particular height and gives you the part of the outline that's below that, the part of the outline that's above it, and the part that's right there. There might be such a piece. And given that, here's the code for combining two bitonic globs. And yeah, it's a bit of a mess. But just look at the structure of the code. Here's this operation O plus. It takes two globs and returns a glob. That's important. It takes two things of the same type and returns something of that same type. It has a three-way case on comparing the heights of the, the x height and the y height. And depending on whether it's less, equal, or greater, there are three different pieces of code that represent the operations that I showed you pictorially on the previous slides uh, for those three cases. And we won't get into the details. But the interesting question is, here's a very complicated piece of code. It's implementing a binary operator on globs. Is it associative? Can we prove that? Well, we could take the two expressions, A O plus B, O plus C, and A O plus B O plus C, and inline uh, the two instances of O plus and do the necessary program source to source transformation and try to reduce them to equivalent forms. You know, and that's, we could do that by hand. I have done that. It's a pain. It'd be nice to have a theorem prover do it or, or a theorem prover built into a compiler, even better. Remember that in my declaration, I promised it was a monoid. So the compiler knows that I intend it to be associative. It'd be nice if the rest of the, uh, of the proof were done automatically or if unit testing could be done or something. Okay. So uh, given that operation, I assure you that it works. You can trust me. So given singleton bitonic globs, we put water on top of them. There it is. None of them hold water. Maybe the whole argument doesn't hold water. We abstract that as bitonic outlines with zero water in them, and then we combine them pairwise. And we're going to do that using a binary tree of O plus operations. And O plus, by the way, is uh, associative. So we are entitled just to use a big O plus operator because we really don't care how they're grouped. We can leave that to someone who's worried about efficiency, about whether it's going to be done sequentially or in parallel. And so the solution is that for every x in the array, uh, we, uh, every such V, we make a singleton glob out of it. We hit it with big O plus. And the answer comes out as a bitonic outline that happens to have the number 35 in it. We reach, carefully reach in and abstract that, uh, extract that last component. And the number 35 pops out, and that's our answer. So as a result, with, all the, pre with the preceding several pages of Fortress code that I showed you, the final solution of Fortress looks like this. It's one liner. What's on the left-hand side is the same um, uh, method signature you saw before. It's so the only new thing is this thing here on the right-hand side. And it says that in order to solve the problem, given the array x, uh, we're going to, for every v in x, make a singleton glob. That's the code that constructs a singleton glob. Hit it with that big O plus operator that combines globs, and then reach in and extract the water component. We're done. OK. Whew. Well, it was very, very clever to be able to write this uh, solution as a one-liner once we build up this very complicated data structure and its associated operations. OK, is there another approach? Well, let's look at that left to right sweep again. That's actually a familiar sort of thing. Um, I'm going to introduce the idea of a monoid cached tree to compute it. And the idea here is that we build up a tree one layer at a time, and in this case, with a combining operation. And that operation should, should belong to a monoid, which is a technical mathematician's term that just means the operation is associative and that it has an identity. Um, yes. So we're going to um, uh, compute max pairwise, and then do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again. And whereas before, I sometimes showed an operator there to indicate these are operations being computed. Here, I'm actually intending this to be represented as an explicit data structure in memory. So we built this tree in memory using this combining operator, max. And so every internal node of the tree now has the result of combining everything that is all the leaves that are below it. OK, very simple idea, but turns out to be remarkably useful. In particular, um, OK, so here's Fortress code to construct a max, max cache tree. Uh, at the top, we have the declaration of this uh, tree uh, data structure. So trait cache tree ha comprises three distinct object types. There's a null node, a singleton node, and a pair node. And their definitions are straightforward. And then to compute a max cache tree, 
if what we have from a list, if what we have is an empty list, we create a null node, and the null node contains the identity for the combining operation. In this case, minus infinity is the identity for max. Or if the list is size one, we create a singleton node from its single element. Otherwise, we split the list into approximately equal non-empty pieces. Uh, then we compute the max cache tree of each of those pieces. And uh, notice the line, comment line that says parallel recursion here. Uh, Fortress allows the two, element, two expressions in a tuple expression to be computed independently. So, um, so there's a potential for parallelism there. And then those results get assigned to the values a and b. And then we use those a and b values to construct a new pair node. OK, so this very simple code will construct this max cache tree. And the point is, is that in order to do the parallel left to right sweep, if we first build a max cached tree, that, which uh, builds the tree from bottom to top, then using a top to down sweep, a, a second pass over the tree, we can compute the result of the, our, parallel lef our left to right sweep in parallel rather than sequentially. And essentially the trick is that as you go down the tree, as you visit each node, information is going to be passed from the left son to the right son or the left child or the right child. Must be uh, gender non-specific here. And um, uh, you do that at each level of the tree, and as things are passed across, it turns out that um, what happens is that at the top node, things are being able to jump distance eight. You're transferring information from the left half to the right half. And then at, the next at each level of the tree, you're passing stuff from the left half to the right half. And so in a logarithmic number of jumps, information can reach where it needs to go. And the result will be, in fact, the very same array we computed before by a sequential pass over, uh, from left to right. Now, just re reversing the diagram, mirror image, we can see we can also use the same max cache tree, because recall the max cache tree itself is symmetric. It doesn't have any left to right or right, right to left bias. So given that same tree, we can do the right to left sweep, passing information from the right each right child to each left child, and compute the same array that um, uh, we computed with a sequential right to left sweep. And in fact, by being very careful how we code the recursion, we can do both at once. As you visit each node, grab information and do that. <laughs> grab information and do that. Keep passing it down in the correct pattern. And you can compute both arrays at once. And the result will look something like this. And yeah, there's a lot of details left out of this, but I will show you the code. There it is. OK, so the code. So here's, the, here's a, uh, an implementation of histogram water. In the top line, what it says is, given the list x, compute its max cached tree of x, then feed that to this recursive routine process, whose job is to do these left to right and right to left sweeps using this child swapping information trick. And it's not very much code. It's just a matter of getting the pattern of swapping information right. And again, it breaks down into three cases uh, of a null node, a singleton node, and a pair node, because that's the uh, structure of the, of the data structure. And the, again, parallel recursion can happen there in the first implementation of process, uh, the, the first method, uh, which takes a pair node. And if it's a pair node, uh, it will process the left tree and process the right subtree. And those two calls to process are arguments of the binary operator plus. And Fortress says if you've got a binary operator, then it's the two argument expressions can be executed independently if the compiler chooses. And so you, there's a potential for, for the parallelism there. So that is the uh, end of that solution. Notice that it was only two pages of code instead of four or five. We have a much simpler data structure. We avoid made, making that complicated by tonic glob thing. Um, there is no need to operate on that special glob data structure or to invent this special O plus or, or define the big O plus operator. And it made use of an abstraction, the, the monoid cache tree that might actually be useful in other settings. So aha, we've got the beginnings of a potential library routine that might be useful in other cases. OK, let's revisit that left to right sweep one more time. It smells familiar. It smells familiar to me. It's actually an example of a parallel prefix operation. Now, if you're not familiar with the parallel prefix operation, I like to use the checkbook metaphor. Suppose you've got a checkbook. If you, if you keep a checkbook, I keep a checkbook. A lot of people just use online statements and depend on the computer to do it. But if you keep a checkbook by hand, you know that you enter deposits and debits in the form of checks, and you keep a running balance. And at every step, the running balance is the result of adding to the previous running balance either the deposit you made or subtracting the, the check that you wrote. And so if you have just a list of deposits and withdrawals represented in suitable positive and negative form, then 
the parallel prefix sum of that list is the set of running balances. Because what parallel prefix really means is given a, a, an array of stuff, find the sum of every prefix of that array. So you find the sum of just the first thing, the sum of the first two things, the sum of the first three things, the sum of the first four things, and so on. And the reason it's usually referred to as the parallel prefix operator is that although there is an obvious sequential left-right implementation, in fact, it's exactly our left to right sweep, but using summation rather than max. We know that there are good parallel implementations of this operation. In fact, we've already seen one. We can do it with a monoid cache tree. That's one strategy, one of several well-known strategies in literature for computing a parallel prefix. So uh, we're just going to abstract that and say, we're going to take left to right sweeps for granted we're using max. And we're just going to uh, say that is a max parallel prefix operation. And we're going to use this notation for it, which is in the upper left of this slide. I'll just write the operator max and then put a left-right arrow over it to indicate that I'm doing a left-right sweep with it, or conceptually left-right sweep. I'm not going to say how it's implemented any more than I say how big sigma is implemented. I just assume this is a library operation. Leave it up to the compiler of the runtime to decide whether it's sequential or parallel. And similarly, the right-to-left sweep, we might be able to indicate by using the operator max with the right-to-left arrow going over it. So let's assume we have these in our library. Then here's the concise solution. Once I have those operators in my library, no more boilerplate. I have a true one-liner in Fortress here. And this works in Fortress. I remind you this is executable code. And it's a big sigma operator. And there are three parts to it. First, we're going to take the list x and the max parallel prefix of it and the max parallel suffix of it. The right left sweep is called a parallel suffix. And we're going to compute those three things. In fact, we can compute them simultaneously. And we'll leave it to a compiler to figure out whether those are computed as three separate operations on three different, different processors, or whether to maybe fuse their loops, you know, various things that a compiler can do. We're just going to compute those three things, the list x itself, its parallel prefix max, and its parallel suffix max. Then we're going to use the zip operator from Haskell, which is also in Fortress, to zip them together, thereby turning a tuple of three arrays into an array of three tuples. It's, in effect, a kind of a matrix transpose. And then for every element of that array, we're going to call the three elements v, left, and right. So in fact, v is the element, the single bar of our bar graph. And left and right are the things that we would have computed during the left-to-right sweeps in, and right-to-left sweeps in the sequential version. So with this, clever, with this clever expression, we have now got a generation process going for the big sigma operator that will generate a triple of values, v, left, and right, for each thing we want to do. Well, what do we want to do with that triple? We want to compute the sub-expression, um, which is to take the left and the right, min them, subtract the original height of the bar. That's the amount of water we got. And then the final thing we're going to do is add them up. So this is a generate step in the yellow, a mapping step, the body, body expression of the big sigma, and a reduce operation, the big sigma. So this is, this is map reduce in math notation. And I think this is actually a really good way to program, not only in the large, but also in the small, even for, even for small stuff like this. Now, is this a sequential solution or a parallel solution? Well, that's a very good question. I really haven't said much about that. I've indicated places in this solution where things can be done independently. So for example, the computing of the max uh, parallel prefix and the max parallel suffix could be computed independently, or perhaps they could be fused as we did when we, we uh, did the clever thing with the monoid cache tree. Uh, all of the instances of the expression to the right of the big sigma are independent. They can be computed independently. Maybe we could do that on a bunch of different processors. But the point, or they can be done sequentially. The point of this is that if we were to take this precise piece of code and do careful inlining of operations such as parallel prefix and parallel suffix and zip, and that could reduce, if their implementations are sequential, then suddenly sequential for loops are going to appear in our code. And we can do loop fusion on those for loops. And in fact, we can transform that into the efficient two-pass sequential solution. And I don't have a compiler that does that automatically, but I have done that transformation by hand. This is about the biggest program I can do it by hand on. And yes, you can reach the sequential solution from this code by doing the appropriate optimizations through source-to-source -source transformations. And I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, belittle the effort it takes to construct such an optimizing compiler, but the techniques involved are already familiar and out there in other compilers. More to the point, from this exact same solution, if we do inlining 
of definitions of the operators that happen to have parallel implementations. Well, those parallel implementations are probably going to operate on either actual tree data structures or at least on computation trees. If we then do deforestation, which I would describe as loop fusion on trees, then the same code can be transformed in the, into the efficient two-pass parallel solution that we saw with the monoid cache trees. So this is the main point of the talk, is that it's possible to write solutions to the problems that don't have a commitment as to whether to be sequential or parallel, and then downstream, either optimization at compile time or decisions made at runtime can make decisions about whether to be sequential or parallel. And this is an opportunity to automate those decisions and make the best use of whatever hardware resources are available at the time. The thing about accumulation is that you start with an empty solution. You use each input to incrementally update the solution. Notice that this incremental update operator is typically asymmetric. It takes two arguments, which are an input and a solution, and produces a solution. As a result, any trees you construct this with this will necessarily be asymmetric, and they will have the form of that long left linear list, or perhaps a right linear list. So the processing will be inherently sequential. So this is great if you're committed to using one processor. It turns out the accumulation strategy is superb for a single sequential processor, which is why we've uh, designed processors that work that way. That's why we have uh, uh, CPUs that have registers. Those registers used to be called accumulators back in the 60s, and before that in the uh, card processing machines in the early part of the 20th century that processed the Hollerith cards. Uh, the registers were called accumulators because typically you'd be feeding census data through them and accumulating various counts. And, uh, and processor registers continued to be called accumulators probably through the early 70s, and then we switched over to the name registers for everything. Not quite sure how that happened. The great thing about accumulators is that while they take linear time, they save space. You pull something out of memory, you add it, the solution tends, you keep the solution small and you avoid building data structures, you can usually keep things in, vari in global variables or at least variables that are local to your routine. Now compare that with the divide and conquer uh, approach. With divide and conquer, from each input you construct a singleton solution. And then you merge the solutions, typically pairwise. This may take more space because it can be done log times. So you do this when you're trying to shorten the time, but this will be at the expense of space. And in fact, intermediate solutions may need to be heap allocated. The merge operator is, for merging two solutions is typically a little more complicated than the incremental update operation that you use in, in, in the accumulation paradigm. But notice that merge is typically associative, and this is possible because look at the type signature of merge, of a merge or of O plus. Its job is to take two solutions and to produce a solution, rather than take a solution and an input and produce a solution. Just from its type signature, you can tell it has the possibility to be associative in a way that the accumulator combining operation does not. And its associativity is a key to parallelism. And, but furthermore, there's another advantage that identifying this associative combining operator usually lends deeper insight into the problem. I wasn't able to see that a monoid cache tree was the answer to my problem until I'd first built the glob combining thing and the thought, okay, how can I further simplify this? Maybe I don't need to completely commit to building the entire solution at once. Maybe I can build a sub-solution in the first pass and then from the sub-solution build a final solution, but doing both with trees. So looking for associativity in the operators of your data structures may lead you insight into the nature of your data structure or the nature of your problem. In fact, not just associativity, but other algebraic properties are also important. And this is the point when I find that uh, the eyes of my audience tend to glaze over when I mention things. Associativity and commutativity, maybe you remember those from, from uh, grade school, particularly if you took something like new math. When I get to idempotence, well, item, what is idempotence? Nobody can remember what idempotence means. Then there's identity and, and z identities and zeros for the combining operations. But it turns out these, ha these have correspond to very simple and appealing ideas that are relevant to every programmer. Associativity just means the way you group them doesn't matter. And that is the key to parallelism. Commutativity means the order doesn't matter. You can swap them around and you'll still get the same answer when you add them up or max them up. Idempotence means duplicates don't matter. So addition is not idempotent, but max is. If you take the max of a bunch of things, it doesn't matter where, for any one thing whether there are duplicates in there or not. You'll still get the same answer. If a value is an identity, that just means this value doesn't matter. You can add it in or not. You'll still get the same answer. And a zero means the other 
values don't matter. I'm the king and I trump everybody else. If you're multiplying a bunch of stuff together, if there's even one zero in there among a million values, the answer is gonna be zero. The other values don't matter. Now, invariance, such as knowing that, uh, that, a proper, that uh, an operator is associative, gives an implementation wiggle room. It gives the compiler or whatever processor is working with the program the freedom to exploit alternate representations and implementations. And in particular, associativity gives implementations the necessary wiggle room to use parallelism or not as resources dictate. So, uh, winding up the talk, uh, I think that going into the uh, next millennium, we need a new mindset. Now, we've got, we've got a, an old mindset from the previous, uh, I was about to say millennium, but I won't be so highfalutin, from the last century, uh, during which we developed a bunch of co program concepts, mostly since the 1950s. But we developed these ideas in the 1950s. We have polished them and honed them so that they, are, they work beautifully in their intended sequential setting. But the truth is that do loops are so 1950s. You know, Fortran is literally over, is over 50 years old. Linear linked lists are so 1950s. Lisp was developed in the 1950s. Java style iterators same, came somewhat later, but they are still so last millennium. The Java iterator data structure commits you, and its API commits you to a sequential processing paradigm. As soon as you say, well, first let's set sum to zero, you're already host. You're already host. And I have, as soon as you say process subproblems in order you lose, a for loop of the C or Java kind is probably the worst possible way to say map. It takes a lot of work to figure out whether such a for loop can in fact be parallelized or whether the iterations of its body are independent or not. The great tricks of sequential paths don't work in a parallel world. And the programming idioms that have become second nature to us over the last five decades as everyday tools don't work in a parallel world. They have to be undone, at least to some extent. And I found that this has changed my programming style even when I know I'm writing sequential code, or even when I intend to. I've, it, as soon as I write uh, int x equals zero, or something like that, there are about five voices clamoring my brain. One says, is int really the right data type? And another says, is x really a good name for that? Why don't you give it a better name? And another says, should that zero be integer or floating point? You know, and, you know, and have I matched it to the... But now there's an extra voice in the clamor that says, are you sure you want an accumulator? Maybe there's a better way to do this. You know, and as, as you write each line of code, there should be these little competing voices. If, you, if you've seen Pixar's Inside Out, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, there are, you know, I've got joy and anger and frustration and, and all that stuff. And then a chorus of GERD crit, nerd critics, you know, criticizing every line of code I write. And I'm adding to that list of critics. So we've got these idioms and they're built into our mindset and they're built into our infrastructure. Our programming, even our parallel programming languages are typically designed by starting with a well-known sequential language and then uh, bolting on a couple of parallel features on the side. I think it's possible to do better. Fortress was an attempt to do that. I think we achieved partial success, uh, but I think more needs to be done. So I think in the parallel, we need parallel strategies and programming language to support them for problem decomposition, data structure design, algorithmic organization, the top-down description of this mindset is don't split a problem into the first and the rest. Instead, try to split problems in equal pieces, solve them, and then combine the solutions. The bottom-up view is that if you have individual inputs or individual leaves of a tree coming at you, don't create a null solution and then successfully update it. Instead, map the inputs to singleton solutions and then figure out how to merge solutions. And that's usually trickier. Okay, I have been, I have, uh, put forward a rather extreme manifesto, and I wanted to make sure I got that manifesto in your face, and I'm gonna back off slightly. In practice, engineering needs to be done. In practice, there are many optimizations, and in particular, in practice, you need to make intelligent decisions about when to be parallel and when to be serial. So, uh, first of all, you probably need optimized representations of singleton lists, because uh, if you represent singleton lists at, explicitly in the heap, um, well, we know down at the leaves of a tree is where most of the action is going on. If you can just save some storage down at the leaves, you're saving half your storage. Uh, you can use tree branching factors larger than two. For example, in the closure programming language, which is a kind of a Lisp dialect uh, uh, designed to fit within the JVM, uh, he chose to represent lists as 64 airy trees. I'm not sure that 64 is the ideal number, but I know it's way better than two. It's also way better than 10 million. Uh, you can use various kinds of self-balancing trees, like red-black trees, finger trees. 
But most importantly, you probably want to use parallelism as you go down the tree until you reach some certain point and then start using sequential techniques at or near the leaves. You might also want to use arrays at the leaves rather than trees. And you can do, thing, do things like the dy dynamically decide whether to process those arrays sequentially or to uh, recursively subdivide the arrays in turn. When you're iterating over an, an integer range, you can decide dynamically whether to process it sequentially or by doing parallel recursive subdivision. This is something we were experimenting with in Fortress. So to conclude, my argument, I've hoped to convince you that a program that is a organized according to linear decomposition principles, the kinds that have been very familiar for the past 50 years, can be very hard to parallelize. I repeat, someone won a Turing Award for writing compilers that do that. It shouldn't be that hard. But if a program is organized according to primarily independence and then secondarily to divide and conquer principles, which is one of many ways of achieving independence, such a program may be possible to run either in parallel or sequentially with the decisions being made dynamically according to available resources. Now, I'd like to compare this proposal to the introduction of garbage collection, which, by the way, also dates back to the 1950s with LISP. And it took some work in the 80s and 90s to parallelize the garbage collectors. Um, garbage collectors were feared for several decades, and it wasn't until Java popularized them, really, that uh, they became mainstream. And there was this fear that I don't know where the storage manager is going to put my data. I don't know what the effect is going to be on the cache. I don't know what the effect is going to be on all kinds of things. And we finally got comfortable with having the allocation of storage, the allocation of data managed automatically. And yes, there are some associated overheads. It's, it's possibly not as good as we could do if we did, did everything compulsively by hand. But doing it by hand is so terribly hard and we have better ways to spend our time as programmers that we're willing to give up a little bit of performance and, hand, hand, uh, and delegate that work over to the garbage collector. And those overheads are present. They have been reduced over time as we continue to engineer the storage managers, but they have not disappeared. I argue that the management of parallelism is very much like garbage collection. It's the automatic assignment of processors rather than the automatic assignment of storage. It's the automatic allocation of code to processors rather than data to memory. And again, we are going to fear this at first because those automatic strategies are going to have overheads that will look um, daunting at first. But I believe that over the next several decades, as we continue to engineer those, the same thing will happen with the garbage collectors. And the overheads will be reduced over time, but not disappear. But I believe that in a world of parallel computers of vi wildly varying size, possibly heterogeneous processors, all this kind of stuff, um, well, we've got heterogeneous memories, too. We've got caches, and we've got disks, and we've got SSDs and all kinds of stuff. And we've got our storage managers deal with that to some extent. And as we have different kinds of processors available, maybe we can learn to manage heterogeneous processors as well. I think there's our only hope for true program portability and not to have to keep rewriting code every five years. Finally, I believe that better programming language design can help to encourage programmers to use the kind of independent thinking that will lead to code that allows parallel programmers to run programs effectively in this way. So that is my vision for the future, and I think it's hard, and maybe a few of you would be interested in trying to make it happen. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Are there questions? There's one in the back, yeah. Yeah, why don't you say, say the question through the mic. Is it possible to get some of this stuff into our current programming languages? New programming languages seem notoriously hard to get accepted. Uh, yes, and we, we see that happening already. Um, uh, one strategy for trying to make things independent is to make things purely functional, and we've got a history of design of, pro of, of purely functional programming languages, and Haskell, I think, is a, a preeminent example of that. But ideas from those languages are leaking over into other things, and we see uh, now map and reduce features that are being introduced into Java, for example, that were quite explicitly inspired by Haskell. And I know that the Java design group at, at Sun and then Oracle has kept an eye on the Haskell uh, evolution for about the last 10, 15 years. So yes, it is possible to graph stuff on, but it's hard, and you never really quite free yourself from the sequential mindset. So we've got the map and stuff in there. The, the Java iterators are also still there. And uh, they're, they're there tempting the programmers. So sure, one can always start with something that isn't quite what you want and bolt new things on the side. The question is, how do you get old things to drop off? 
And uh, maybe that is best done by a process of language evolution and, and letting things just fall away and decay, rather than designing new, something new from scratch. Because I agree, it's really hard to get a full-blown language uh, uh, adopted uh, if, it's, if it's unfamiliar and new. I gave Fortress only, at most, a 20% chance of becoming big and making it. And surprise, surprise, it was in the 80%. But I think we learned a few things from it. And I've had some inquiries recently from, the, uh, uh, from a Julia users group wanting to hear talk about Fortress, hoping it can inform the evolution of Julia, which is a language that has gained more traction and is headed in this direction. <coughs> Other questions? I know I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> Three, two, one. Uh, yes. So um, the concise solution that you had at the very end uh, was nice in that it was short and it was easy to sort of automatically optimize to the sequential and parallel implementations. But it also came at a cost where it took the better part of half an hour to explain how it worked to a room full of Google engineers and convince them that it was correct. So <laughs> do you think that there's a tension there where um, in order to have these sort of better parallel optimization techniques, it sort of comes at the cost of having to uh, solve our problems in a more complex way, mentally complex way, not necessarily code difficulty. Um, or is that just a sort of function of the fact that we were looking at, you know, sort of like an interview style brain teaser solution? Okay. Uh, yes, your points are very well taken. Uh, I've got several responses. First of all, you flatter me. In, in trying to make me think that I've actually proved the correctness of this program to you. I don't believe I have. I think I provide some informal justification and, and tried to give you some intuition as to why it might be right. And furthermore, I've tested it. You know, um, uh, yes, uh, it is possible be, to be misled by examples that are small enough to fit on presentation slides. And so you should always be aware of that as well. Um, yes, if I have a data structure that has dozens of components rather than five, spotting or even coding that associ relevant associative operator might not be easy to do or it might not even be the right thing to do. You, but in that case, you might want to break your data structure down into smaller pieces and work on them separately. Uh, on the other hand, uh, about the unfamiliarity of it, yes, uh, how many of you had already seen the idea of a parallel prefix before? Let me just take a quick poll. Okay, I'm seeing uh, about 15 hands. Okay. Now, how many of you have seen a summation operator before? Okay, all of you. So I didn't have to explain that to you. If only we had, were to reach a point where everybody already knew what parallel prefix was, then things would be somewhat simpler. At least that step of the explanation could be emitted. And uh, yes, it's, a, it's an uphill road. There's an education process involved. And before that, just identifying what are the relevant primitives. I believe that parallel prefix is an important one. There will probably be others as well. And in fact, I explored some and wrote papers about them back in the 80s when I was at Thinking Machines Corporation working on the Connection Machine, which was a uh, highly parallel supercomputer of that era. But this situation uh, doesn't discourage me because it reminds me a little bit of the structured programming revolution in the 1970s, when it was suggested that one limit oneself by not being able to write uh, arbitrary branch statements anywhere in your code, but you should limit yourself to if, then, else, and while, do, and a handful of other structured things. And at first, programmers were flummoxed because they said, well, I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and I don't see how to package it up using those primitives. And it took a while to develop a style of programming in which the go-to really was not used very often at all. But there was, there was a real uh, passionate debate about that in the early 70s. And you can look that up. There's a debate at, I think, the 1972 ACM National Conference. And I took part in that debate. I was still a little wet behind the ears. I was st a student. But uh, people like Bill Wolf of Carnegie Mellon were there. He worked on the Bliss compiler. And uh, the Bliss compiler was one of the first systems programming languages to say, we can do systems programming without a go-to statement. And people were dumbstruck and said, wait, you can't do that. You know, operating systems, of course you need to go to. So it's a matter of figuring out what are the relevant primitives and then developing a community consensus on a style that actually uh, achieves uh, the goals of programming within that set of primitives. And so I would like to think by analogy, we can find a set of parallel programming primitives that are adequate for 90% of the structuring of our code in much the same way that the structured primitives like while do and if then else did turn out to be adequate for structuring 90% of our sequential code. So I said it's a grand vision. <laughs> it's a result of synthesizing you know, 40 years of experience. And it's not that I mean to play the experience card, it's just that I've got an appreciation for history and I've lived through probably two thirds of it. <laughs> and I've tried to study the rest. And uh, so I think there's some lessons for going forward. And it's not that I think it will be easy. I think it will be hard, but I think 
you'll be hard in the same, same way that some other earlier things were hard and we got over those. So long answer to your short question. Yeah. A, a quick question about recursion. It, it seems to me when I look at things like the definition of regular expressions and all of these things, they have all recursions that, that, that go exactly what you say don't. Oh, here's my starting point and then do a bunch of those. How do we get away from that? Yes. Um, yeah, we do that in regular expressions and more generally when writing parsers, for, uh, sorry, grammars for programming language, we tend to stick to left recursion or right recursion precisely because we know then the parser generators will have an easier time dealing with it. But that's because they're going to then generate sequential parsing algorithms. If your parser generator were going to generate a parallel parser, you might write your grammars and your regular expressions in that grammar in a different way. And I speak from experience, I've actually tried those experiments. Yeah. Just curious, what is the cost of merging two bitonic globs? What is the cost of merging two bitonic globs? Okay, let's uh, go back about 50 slides. Uh, there it is. Okay. Uh, most of the cost actually is in this three way split operator that's used to take either a, a uh, a left outline or a right outline and try to find the point where the water is going to be so you can break off just half part of it and use that as a part of a resulting outline. Um, all the rest of it, I'm just scanning the code quickly, yes, all the rest of it is constant time. The problem is that three-way split. And that is done on the previous page in essentially by doing a uh, binary decomposition of the list. So that is a log time operation. That's log time in the length of, of that half of the outline. And I couldn't figure out a way to make that, that log factor disappear. So this combining operation is, is, not, um, is uh, not constant time. And therefore, uh, the overall combining time is not going to be log n, but probably uh, the square of log n. And I'd love to find a way to do better in this approach. Yeah. I, I have used a lot of the things that you have built over the years, and I just wanted to say thanks. Thank you. <laughs> that means a lot to me that you found something useful. Do any of the popular languages that are in, in common use today show promise in the directions that you're, that you're thinking about things? So you've created this, this new language. You mentioned Julia. You mentioned Haskell a couple times. Yes. Uh, are any of those, do you think, the right place to concentrate on adding these features, these types of ways of thinking uh, about things? Yeah, I think that Julia and Haskell and Clojure are probably the most widely used uh, languages uh, that are intentionally exploring in these directions. I think such exploration could also be done in, say, Scala, but uh, the Scala community, I think, does not make a priority of investigating that dimension. Okay. So th this may be sort of bias or selection, you know, selection bias on my part, but you mentioned those languages, and I don't think of them as being very widely used. Um, do you think there's room for things like this in, say, Python, which I know has map and reduce operators and so has a little tendril in this direction? Yes, I'd be delighted if the Python community suddenly said, that, yeah, this is what we want to do, <laughs> you know. But, I don't, but the Python community is really big, and while there is some exploration, it's a relatively small fraction of the Python community. Yeah, Julia has a much smaller community, but they are really pressing in this direction. And they're all more popular than Fortress, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> Help me, Obi-Wan. You are my only hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, and just sort of balancing the larger language, less interesting community, but yeah, that, we'll find out what happens over time. Yeah. So I'm just going around talking to all kinds of communities, including you, hoping to find some interest, and maybe you'll take it in a direction I never thought of. Yeah, question here. So you compared the parallelization to the structured programming 40 years ago, um, and I think one real difference is that the programming community was a lot smaller back then. So do you think, like, because of how many programmers there are out in the world these days that there's more inertia and it's going to be harder for like a few computer scientists with a debate and a few papers to like change the way the programming is going? Uh, my initial reaction is, oh yeah. On the other hand, I think the programmers of the 1970s were somewhat more fractious and contentious than they are now. <laughs> you know, there were, there were a bunch of, you know, really, you know, st even in 1960, there were stubborn old timers, you know, who've been doing this, you know, since, you know, 1945, <laughs> you know, who had experienced all of programming history, right, you know, uh, except for, except for uh, Ada Lovelace, essentially. 
And uh, they said, well, we're settled in. We've got the way we want to do it. And Fortran is good enough for, the, for us, thank you, or COBOL. And didn't, didn't want to change. And yet, you know, small groups arose and took things in new directions. Um, so yeah, I think there's more inertia, but I think there's less resistance today to new ideas. So I, I, think, I think the programmers are a little more open to trying out new ideas if it's clear that they will solve a problem for them. Whereas uh, I don't, I'm seeing a lot less of the um, uh, programming language religion wars, let's say, which was a, a, a term of, of technical art back in the 70s. How does this all apply to um, working with the real world? A lot of what I do is user interface programming, for example. Is that, is that parallelizable? Like, what, what thoughts do you have about that sort of thing? Good question. Well, um, there are different kinds of user interface programming. Uh, if, you're, if, you, if you are handling an inherently sequential interaction with a single user, well, then sure, maybe there's not much to do. And part of the problem is that our users tend to be sequential. If only we had parallel users, then things might be easier. <laughs> but the things you're presenting to the user, uh, I, think there's, I think if HTML had been designed a little bit differently, there'd be a lot more opportunity to process the different parts of web page being presented than there are now. And we kind of struggle to try to find the parts that can be done independently. Can I process this ad while also working on the main text, you know, and then throw things up? But they interact in weird ways. You know, so yeah, I, th I think there are, there's opportunity everywhere. And then the question is, as a question of engineering, is it then worth exploiting the potential parallelism or not? You know, if you could get two processors going on processing your mouse clicks instead of one, you'd probably take it, you know, unless the processor were better spent, better spent doing something else. It's probably a good time to end. Thank you very much.